Okay, thank you. And here for a, a presentation um, towards the end of our day, we are talking about translating research into action and communicating research outside academia regarding the SDGs. So today we have with us Dr. Joe Wixon from Wiley, uh, Dr. Roger Worthington from um, an NHS education provider, and Jay Patel, who is at Cactus Global. And I'll hand over to Joe to start us off. Thank you, Laura, for the kind introductions and for the invitation to be here to speak to you all. So we're coming to talk to you today to, with the aim of improving the sharing of practical implications of SGD-related research with those who can implement them and make a difference. As a multi-stakeholder group of publishers, researchers, societies, suppliers, librarians and sustainability practitioners, the HESI SDG Publishers Compact Fellows want to see research findings converted into practical action beyond academia to solve the challenges outlined in the Sustainable Development Goals. We're here to discuss the why and how of this with you all, hoping to drive greater use of plain language summaries and bullets to share actionable implications of research with those outside academia who can put them into practice and make change. First, Roger will share the why this is so important, from his experience as both a practitioner and a policy advisor, needing to find and use this type of information. We acknowledge that producing and hosting these summaries places a burden on authors and publishers, and we often hear from researchers, such as at the recent Open Pharma Summit session on plain language summaries, that they're not trained to write for lay audiences and how challenging this can be for them. So we then asked Jay to talk to us about the how being a lot easier than it used to be, with careful deployment of AI to support publishers and authors at scale. So, over to you, Roger. Thank you, Joe. Um, yes, I, I, I have a number of different identities, um, and I'm really here today as, as co-chair of the SDG Publishers Compact Fellows, so that's sort of my, my reason for being here, but uh, one of my jobs is to uh, run um, professional development courses for, for doctors, junior doctors, as well as consultants uh, in the NHS within the UK. So, um, communication between academics and practitioners is not always um, as good as it might be. Um, sometimes, of course, people have dual roles. Um, I mean, I've worked in university hospitals for a long time, and in which case, you know, many of the clinicians will have academic roles as well, uh, in which case it's fine. But that is, you know, not always the case by any means. Um, so it's important that, um, that they uh, communicate with each other in, in a meaningful way. Um, because if, this, if the research is disconnected from you know, the day-to-day the, the -day work of the practitioner, and I use the word practitioner broadly, although I work in a medical context, it could mean practitioner in, in any field, I mean, typically the professions, uh, but somebody who is actually putting policy into, into action um, and sort of at, at the front line of whatever um, uh, area it is. And some people see the academic research as being just not relevant and outside of, of you know, something they haven't got time for. So, and sometimes, of course, there's a question of, of access. Gain is different if you're in a, in working in an um, academic setting as well as a practice setting. Um, but some practitioners um, you know, simply don't have access to the literature and then sometimes they really just don't have the time to sit and, and study it carefully. So what can we do to improve this? Um, abstracts, of course, are always openly accessible. Um, and we think the use of plain language summaries is useful because it, um, it, when somebody is under pressure of time, it allows them to, to see briefly what is, is going on um, and keep help to keep themselves informed. So um, as a group, the, the fellows take the, the position that including plain language summaries in, within abstracts helps to bridge this, bridge this gap between um, academics and practitioners. And there is some evidence to support the validity of this position. And we've just got a couple of, of research um, quotes here, uh, surveys that have been done um, in the last couple of years, um, saying that um, in the first one, over 70% of respondents uh, thought that plain language summaries were very or extremely useful. 
um, and the other one, it was, it was about 60% um, said that um, abs articles with the plain language summaries were downloaded significantly more often than those without. So we think there is a case for including these. Um, another issue, um, I've done a lot of work in, uh, as a policy advisor with various um, national bodies um, and policy makers and executives um, they don't always want to know all the technicalities behind the rationale. So if an advisor uh, publishes a report, for instance, um, it, the advisor is, is the, um, the super expert and knows all the technical language, but usually in the reports, the, the, the summary um, needs to be accessible and easily understood so that it stands a better chance of being implemented. So we think that these plain language summaries can potentially help to facilitate communication between the so-called expert and those responsible for making decisions and actually implementing the policy. In other words, bringing about change. The Sustainable Development Goals movement is not just about rhetoric, um, it's about moving the needle in terms of the way people function, the way people do their business, the way people conduct their lives. So in terms of uh, sustainable development, um, practitioners sometimes maybe the general public also see it as or somebody else's concern, you know, what can I do um, to, that might make a difference? Um, or they might see that research on sustainability is, is not relevant to their discipline. Well, we don't think that is the case because we think it's really relevant across the board. Um, but communication between practitioners, um, even within a profession, is sometimes limited. Um, I've been at, at medical conferences where clinicians have, have met and they're so used to going to events that are uh, single discipline events that you know, they don't even meet people from other clinical specialists because they're working in their silos. Um, so communication across boundaries is, is good and so plain language summaries can help, but sus uh, sustainability is, is a, an important topic of conversation for everyone. Um, the third point on this slide is that academic authors don't necessarily know how to write for the general reader because they're trained in academic writing and they're not journalists or broadcasters, or some of them are, but, but not many. So it then brings us to the question of, of AI um, and how to produce these plain language summaries. And this is the point where I'm going to hand over to my friend Jay, who, if all the technology works, um, is going to talk to us from... Um, uh, from New Jersey. So, sorry, we've gone too far. I think the slides are going to be taken over from by Jay. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Roger. <clears throat> it's nice to uh, speak to all of you. Please let me know if you can see my slides. Hi, yes, we can see them. Ah, great. Fantastic. Well, thank you again, Roger. Thank you for uh, having me. I wish I could be there in person. Uh, it's great that I could join virtually. Um, yeah, so as, um, you know, as Roger was mentioning, uh, that it's really important that researchers utilize plain language summaries to communicate their research to various audiences uh, and to help educate those audiences about what their research is actually about and why, uh, you know, why it makes sense for them to uh, utilize it. Um, you know, one of the issues with plain language summaries is um, that simply it needs to scale. There's so many publications, so many papers being published every year that you can't realistically do a plain language summary for all of them. Um, so you have to pick and choose. So there needs to be a scalable solution that's efficient. Um, you also have to be able to uh, make the output from that solution uh, easily accessible uh, to the different audiences. And this is really where, um, you know, the av uh, available AI tools uh, can uh, become useful for creating those plain language summaries. Um, but the other questions that arise uh, is, are they accurate enough? Um, and we know that uh, large language models and chatbots uh, tend to introduce hallucinations, um, you know, everything f from misinformation, uh, down to uh, issues with references and citations that may not exist, um, you know, you know, along with uh, language that uh, may not really be acceptable. Um, and then, of course, uh, you also have to consider 
uh, you know, what the cost is. Who is actually going to pay for this? Is it the author? Is it the funder? Is it the publisher that's going to pay for this? Um, you know, so there, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that need to be considered uh, before you decide to roll out plain language summaries uh, at scale. Um, the good news is that more journals are publishing plain language summaries than they were 5, 10, 15 years ago. Um, so, you know, that's really great. Uh, you know, a lot of them are taking it upon themselves to, to develop these plain language summaries. Authors are also uh, more aware of the value of plain language summaries and are looking to develop them as well as a part of the, part of the submission or post-submission. Um, but realistically, it takes a lot of time uh, to prepare plain language summaries. Uh, and as Roger mentioned, researchers could, um, uh, you know, f face a big obstacle when it comes to taking their research and distilling it down to 150 or 200 words uh, plain language summary. Um, and like with everything else, um, authors do require more training on how to really have to write plain language summaries. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's not something that many of them are taught, and it's really not something that many of them are comfortable with. Um, Right. <clears throat> so some of the so there are a lot of tools and platforms out there right now, and they just keep growing day by day. Um, but here's just a very small list of them. Of course, you know, uh, ChatGPT and Bard, which is now Gemini. There's uh, Perplexity and Claude. These are all uh, all closed platforms. Uh, we do have open platforms uh, like Zero One Dot AI and Falcon Forty B, which are uh, you know which are Chinese uh, developed in China. And then we have Bloom and Llama 2. Um, so those are more open access. And again, another closed access is, is Bing, which realistically runs off of GPT. Um, and one of my personal favorites and one that I've used for many years is ScholarC. Um, and I find that to be extremely useful for someone like myself who doesn't really come from a research or an academic background. Um, and it really helps me better understand um, research that I'm interested in that otherwise would be quite challenging uh, for me to understand. Uh, but as I said, there's a lot of a lot of platforms and a lot of tools out there, so you just kind of have to explore and test and play around with them and see which one works uh, best for you and your um, and your needs. Um, uh, so at at Cactus, one of the things that we have rolled out recently is the ability to um, use AI as a co-pilot or an assistant to developing plain language summaries, um, and this is. You know, this is our process that we follow when we create those plain language summaries. So, uh, in the beginning, we start off by taking, ha having the author provide us some information about their about their manuscript. Uh, once we receive that intake form, uh, we utilize a prompt library that we have developed over the last year, uh, with a lot of testing that we've done with GPT, uh, in order to make sure that we're asking the right questions uh, of GPT to get the right output. Um, so it's really critical that you um, you know you know what prompts to ask and that um, you know you you really develop the right prompts for exactly what you're looking for. Um, once we do that, we get an output uh, from GPT, and that's actually reviewed by a subject matter expert um, on our team. So all of these uh, plant and language summaries will go through uh, a human review. Uh, once we are happy with what the output is, we send it, we transfer it over to the author and or the journal, and then there's an author review and an editorial review as well. Um, and once everyone is happy with it and, uh, you know, everyone signs off, then the journal can move forward with publishing it. Um, so, uh, you know, we still believe that it's really important to have people involved in this process because we're not at a stage where we can fully trust uh, that the uh, large language models are uh, you know are not introducing things like uh, hallucinations into the output, um, and you know sometimes even with good instructions, uh, the large language models may not output uh, what you're exactly looking for or what you might be comfortable with publishing in your journal. Uh, so we believe it's always very important to have uh, someone, a human being, involved in that review process uh, before you hit publish. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, the, um, the, this brings us to the Q&A. We had a short presentation, so I'd like to invite any questions that you may have. Please in the middle here, towards the front.
Thanks. Hi, it's uh, Ben Calber from Cassini. I was wondering if you'd looked at any other approaches besides plain language su summaries. I'm thinking particularly of things like uh, podcasts, videos, seminars, those sorts of um, channels to engage practitioners and policymakers. Thank you, Ben. Um, we didn't include it here for the interest of time, but yes, you're right. There's a lot of great evidence showing the graphical abstracts, videos, and other methodologies are very good at attracting the attention, particularly of the public, the interested public. And so they can be very effective. We do have quite a few journals who use graphical abstracts and supplementary podcasts and videos. So we definitely recommend those also. Um, the plain language summary and bullets is really more about a any publisher of any size or, or scale would be able to manage that as a kind of good entry point, if you like. But yeah, we very much would agree with you that, that, that those kind of um, media or formats are very effective, yeah, for sure. And towards the back in the middle. Lisa Hinchliffe at the University of Illinois. I'm wondering if you could share with us um, any publisher reactions, because I'm, I'm sitting here kind of thinking like, well, I'm also f helping facilitate the AI workshop here, um, which is all about people using AI in ways we don't want them to. And so I'm, I'm wondering if publishers, in your experience, are um, having, are, are these publishers that are not prohibiting the use of AI in their manuscript development? Because I'm thinking myself as an author, if I've just gone through a submission process where basically I was told if I used AI, I should absolutely like, you know, be, I'm unethical, I've like, or I better at least disclose it, um, like very anti, and then I get all the way through and they're like, by the way, we'd like a plain language summary and we're using AI to create that. So I'm feeling a little bit of disconnect here of um, when, so I'm, I realize you are not the, yourselves doing that, but as you are trying to get publishers to use this product, um, are you encountering that disconnect or are we just in two different parts of the company having two different conversations? I don't, Jay, do you want to go first on that one? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think there is a clear disconnect. I think there's a disconnect between the editorial side and the marketing side of the house. Um, and also different comfort levels for how AI can be used, uh, you know, in communicating uh, the science. Um, so the publishers I've spoken to, uh, it's been a mixed bag. Some of them have said, wow, we, we would never do this. And uh, we actually do have uh, two societies that, ha that we're, we are currently working with where uh, they are using our, uh, our you know, AI enhanced plain language summaries with the human review layer uh, included in there. Um, with one of those societies, we're actually also doing <clears throat> um, AI audio summaries. So we're taking um, we're taking uh, one page summaries and feeding them into uh, you know into an AI uh, AI system and generating audio summaries uh, with an AI voice. Um, you, you know, so yeah, I think there's a disconnect, uh, but at the same time, I, you know, um, it's really important that publishers learn to leverage these tools to make it easier for um, authors uh, to communicate their research, but then also to make that research more accessible um, to readers, um, you know, that they want to reach uh, globally. Thanks. Thanks, Jay. Yes, I mean, it's just in answer to your question, it's really just one tool among many. And the um, repost that we've often had from, from publishers is, well, you know, who's going to pay for all this? Um, it takes time and money to produce these plain language summaries. And so we're saying that we think there's a role for AI, perhaps to produce the first draft, um, but then it needs somebody who really knows what they're doing and knows the literature and, and the subject matter to be able to sort of put it into shape before it goes out um, you know, as a publication. I think, think that's probably where we stand on that. So there's no disconnect, even though it's, I, I, I appreciate what you, you know, your potential concerns are. But I think if it's used appropriately, it, it has, has value. Okay, we have another question um, in the middle, just in front of Lisa. Hi, thanks. Um, this is probably a question for Joe. Um, so um, the SDG research, I mean, lots of publishers are doing this interdisciplinary research, trying to get academic um, 
research in front of policymakers. Now, that's always been a real problem. But what is, is the group doing to address that and what kind of um, actions are, are going forward on that? Uh, thanks for asking. Yeah, so um, as a group, we don't just look to try and suggest what others should do. Part of our role is to also produce practical guidance and support. And so we have produced two uh, tailored author guides, which any journal could use and adopt if they wanted to. One aimed specifically at policymakers and the public and the level of language and tone you'd be looking at there. And the other aimed at professionals or practitioners, however you might like, wish to clarify classify them. We've come across different opinions on that. Those working in industry, let's say, in the industrial or applied space who have more expertise in the area but might not want to go right into the level of jargon that a PhD or a postdoc or a professor might use. And so those are there and could literally just be lifted straight into any journal that wanted to use them in their author policy. As far as we're concerned, they're open access. We've worked hard to draft them. They point to a lot of examples and case studies, such as one of our collaborators, Open Pharma, in the medical space, have done some excellent work generating consensus on plain language summaries. Lots of examples from different fields and quite a few of our society partners, um, for example, across the different publishers who are in the fellows. So yeah, we are here to help, not just say, go out and do this to people and expect them to magically solve it. So yeah, absolutely agree that the policymaker space is a bit more challenging, so that piece has some links to some great work by companies and specialists who work in that interface between science and policy, so we've connected to a lot of their work and advice, and again, in our interactive training session, we brought in a group who work on that to co-present with us to talk the audience through, and it's a, it's a freely available recording, uh, the differences of pitching for policy. I hope that answers your question. Have any other questions? Yes, cover it from River Valley. I'm wondering if, when we, when, when authors, researchers write papers, they are expected to write in a kind of formal way. Sometimes will with gobbledygook and 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 so. Perhaps if they, if they wrote in a more simple way, we, we wouldn't need to sort of reverse engineer and make them plain. Um, well, maybe I shall have a go at that one first. Um, yes, I know what you're saying. Um, there is uh, sometimes uh, a level of obfuscation and that you can just hide behind so much technical language that the, the actual message you know, gets completely lost. Um, you know, I've certainly been to plenty of conferences and heard presentations and I sat in my thought to myself at the end, actually I have no idea what you're talking about, even though I should really understand. At the same time, uh, there is still a need for technical language. I mean, medicine, for instance, um, medicine has its own language and when doctors are communicating with each other, they talk that language. Um, and, but when they're talking, hopefully, if they're well trained, um, if they're talking with patients, then they would use the equivalent of a plain language summary, except they're, you know, they're speaking you know, face to face. If they're talking with a patient about the consent or something to go and have a, a procedure done or something, then that needs to be done jargon free. Um, but within communication between professionals, there's, there's certainly scope for technical language. Um, but I think it's a question of, of, of how it's used. Um, and uh, I think the best authors are the ones that are capable of, of getting beyond that. Um, and, uh, and some of, uh, you know, some very well-known authors, you know, very, who are highly skilled and have all the technical knowledge, still manage to break through and, and, and communicate to a wider audience. Uh, yeah, and as a biochemist, I would absolutely, by training, I'd agree with you. There's a lot of extremely technical language that is necessary to explain the pathways and the mechanisms that go on inside an organism. And, and most of the biochemists and pharmacologists that I know from my career find it quite painful to imagine how on earth they're going to simplify that and not lose the meaning and the nuance of what they're trying to describe. So. While I absolutely agree with you, <laughs> I love the gobbledygook as well. Um, yes, we do tend to load papers with as much jargon as possible to impress people, for sure. I was definitely encouraged to do that during my PhD myself and my thesis also. But um, some of it is necessary. When you're really in a very complex pathway that you're trying to describe, it's very, very hard to back out of that. And I've seen the angst that authors face when they're trying to work out how on earth to write 
plain language summary. I should say we're also largely advocating for it being done when an article has practical implications. We're not saying every article should have one. So a super in-depth piece about a pathway that, that a, a working person is never going to need to know stick with the deep <laughs> the deep science but when you've just shown that one medicine's better than another in a particular population type something like that that can be applied mm. let's make that clear so yeah we're not saying every article should have one for sure um, if i can just come come back on that briefly um yes absolutely there is uh, always going to be uh, a need for professionals in whatever sphere to communicate with each other using the appropriate language that they all understand i don't think anybody's questioning that um but wearing the sort of my sustainability hat in terms of you know the work of the fellows which is really where all this started um, and trying to get the sustainability agenda uh, further up you know, in terms of people's thinking um, and making it easily understood I think that's where you know in particular it has an important role to play um, and particularly in terms of communicating with the general public because if they just see it as being too full of jargon then they will just switch off and say oh that's that's other people's business Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'd like you to thank our speakers today on SDGs.